everybody. Welcome to Pacific University's Lunch with the Boxer series today. My name is Gina. I'll be your host today and your moderator. Uh, throughout the session, if you have any questions, feel free to go ahead and enter it in the chat box below. Um, if you're feeling a little shy and you don't want everybody to read your question, feel free to go ahead and um, email it to me or I'm um, sorry, uh, private message me directly on the chat. Again, my name is Gina Lee and I'll go ahead and read those questions aloud for you. Um, and one more time, if you can ensure that your first and last name is listed on there so we can ensure um, that if there are any questions that we aren't able to get to today that we'll be able to follow up. Um, and so with that said, I would definitely like to introduce to you guys, Professor Joel Godis from our uh, Department of Chemistry. Hi, Joel, how are you today? I'm doing pretty good. Glad awesome. to be here. Yes, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm just gonna go ahead and hand it over to you. I know we have a couple of people who are still gonna probably hop in um, a little bit later um, throughout the session, but we'll just go ahead and get started and I'll turn it over to you. Okay, so we'll start out with the really unimportant things like who I am. Um, so my name's Joel Godas and I'm a professor in the Department of Chemistry at Pacific University. I've been there for, um, 18 years, I think. Uh, I taught for six years before that in Colorado at a public um, university, Fort Lewis College. It was a public liberal arts university. And so I've been teaching for about 25 years. Um, so I grew up in Wisconsin in a small town and I went to college uh, in Minnesota at a liberal arts college called Carleton College in Northfield, Minnesota. And there, uh, I almost majored in uh, English literature, and I spent a year in geology and ended up uh, majoring in chemistry because I just I loved chemistry, and I liked the problems and the way that people thought in in chemistry. And after college, I went directly to graduate school in Berkeley, where I got my PhD in inorganic chemistry. Um, it was a great place to, to get a PhD because they're a really good school, people from all over the world and like tons of new ideas that I uh, was exposed to and new ways of, of thinking about problems. Um, after that, I spent two years on the East Coast uh, doing what's called a postdoc. Um, so I did research at Harvard University for two years. And then I spent three years at Los Alamos National Lab doing uh, another postdoc before I started teaching. And so I have uh, a lot of uh, research experience and then a lot of teaching experience as well. Um, and I came to Pacific uh, for a, a couple of reasons. Some were personal reasons. Um, my wife and I uh, at the time were living in separate cities trying to find um, positions in the same area in, in Durango, Colorado, which is where Fort Lewis was, was a tiny, tiny town. And there just weren't opportunities for her there. And so we ended up moving out here. Uh, but Pacific really fit the kind of place that I was looking for um, in that it's a small place that values teaching, values personal interactions, uh, but at the same time, has uh, rigorous academics and an emphasis on uh, research, which is development of new knowledge. Um, and that's across all fields, not just in chemistry. Right, so our department has um, seven, is that right? Seven faculty members and two staff members uh, that the staff members kind of run the infrastructure. They make sure that the lab supplies and stuff are, are there and, and maintain our instruments. We probably have a couple million dollars worth of instrumentation that they uh, uh, keep running for us. And um, I think our curriculum in chemistry is, is fairly standard. Um, you know, we have our general chemistry and organic chemistry and um, all the subfields in chemistry. And we don't have specializations per se. Uh, instead, what we do is, is our upper division courses at the 400 level 
Um, we have a, a variety of two credit courses, which are half courses, and then some four credit courses. And that allows us to have a lot of flexibility. And we, we change our two credit upper division courses all the time in order to um, meet student interest and needs. Right? And so I teach a, a course sometimes in called bioinorganic chemistry, which is based on the training I had as a PhD, which we investigate how metal ions behave in biological systems, which um, for our students is, is really nice because a lot of our students are interested in the health professions. And so the, the biological side of chemistry is something that we actually emphasize quite a bit. So our student body in chemistry, uh, a, we have about on average 12 majors per year. So we graduate 12 uh, chemistry majors per year. Um, when they graduate, they go on to a variety of things. On average, it is about a third go on to graduate school in chemistry. About a third go on to uh, graduate school in health professions, mostly pharmacy, but some uh, optometry. Um, some uh, MD, uh, and then about a third of our students go on to get uh, jobs in industry straight out. And the jobs in, that they get in industry, uh, we have some that worked at, for example, Intel or Nike. In Intel, they're working on the, in the fabrication plants, uh, basically running instrumentation. Uh, at Nike, uh, a variety of things, actually. Some of them have gotten into sales after entering as uh, technical uh, work in the labs there. Um, we also have uh, quite a few students that go into testing labs, like environmental testing labs or food quality testing labs, that kind of stuff. Right? So that's the kind of thing that they do when they uh, first come out of college. And then we have maybe one or two students go into teaching every year. That's becoming actually a bigger uh, number. It used to be one every other year, but more, more students are interested in that now. So that's a little bit about me and about the department. Um, and so this is really mostly uh, going to be about questions that you have for us. And we did get a couple of questions um, emailed ahead of time. And so I thought maybe I'd just start out with those, um, maybe to give you guys time to think about what you might want to ask. So the first question was about, they're both about um, health professions. And the first one was about the difference between physician's assistant and uh, an MD or a doctor. Right. What are the difference? What are the question was actually what are the advantages of uh, going into physician's assistant? And I um, so I'm not an expert in the physician's assistant program, but what I can say is that the physician's assistant uh, training is not quite as extensive as the training you get uh, if you pursue an MD. Right, so I believe it's a three-year program instead of a four-year for uh, medical school. Um, the residency requirements are also uh, somewhat uh, less, right? So you're gonna go to, to school um, for quite a bit longer in, uh, if you get an MD versus a, a PA. Um, there are also differences in the responsibilities that you have when you actually become a PA versus an MD. Um, I would say that the PA, you're going to interface a little bit more with patients directly. I don't think most PAs are going to be doing things like prescribing uh, drugs, um, and you certainly don't specialize in um, like surgery and things like that. Right, so it's, it's a, a little bit of a more general education. Um, in terms of like the lifestyle impact, I think in general, PA, because they have a little bit less training, they're gonna have a little bit less responsibility. And so the intensity of their lifestyle might be a little bit less. And then you'll also make a, probably a little less money um, coming out. And of course for MD that really 
depends highly on the specialization that you do, right? The, 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 the disparity in pay between different types of doctors is probably a factor of 10 between like a general practitioner versus uh, anesthesiologist, right? The huge differences. Um, and partly that's due to the insurance costs that, that you're exposed to. Um, so that's about, I hope <laughs> that was getting at um, that question. What I'd recommend is actually uh, we have a PA school at Pacific and um, contact them directly ab about something like that, right? Um, when you go into health professions, one of the things that as students you will have to do is you'll have to spend quite a bit of time shadowing. Uh, graduate programs require that so that they know that you have a really good idea of what you're getting into, right? And so those are the kinds of questions that you also would ask people when you shadow, right? And we have a career center that helps set up shadowing uh, experiences for students. Um, and so the school will help you set up those opportunities. Uh, we also have an advantage program um, where if you're interested in health professions, you can sign up, uh, enroll in the advantage program. And then there's a, a first year class that kind of introduces you to all the different uh, programs, all the different uh, areas of health professions that we have. Um, and they'll bring in experts in those particular fields where you can uh, find out uh, more specific information. Okay, so the second question was about optometry and it was a two part question. It was one about what's the lifestyle of an optometrist like, and then what's the most difficult thing about becoming uh, an optometrist? Um, the first one, <laughs> what's the lifestyle like? <laughs> You don't really know until you live it, and I'm not an optometrist, so I can't really tell you. Um, but my impression is that in optometry, um, it kind of is a nine to five type of lifestyle, right? And so you control kind of your, you control your hours, um, and it's not crazy hours, um, but it's, you know, can be pretty intensive work. Um, when you first come out, you probably will be working as, you'll get hired by an optometry center or, or something like that, or, or work in uh, to, an optometry clinic in, um, for example, uh, in a supermarket or so, something like that, right? Um, and so you'll be working for somebody else. They'll kind of define your hours and things like that. But a lot of our students, after they do that for four or five years, will um, move on to open their own practice um, where then they get to decide who works when and how, how much you're gonna work. Um, and a liberal arts education is really good for that because if you're thinking about that ahead of time, you can take classes in business that are gonna help you set up your own business later on. Um, so what's the most difficult thing about becoming an optometrist? I like that question because the answer is, it depends on you, on your strength. So in the optometry program, it's science intensive. And just in science, there are, uh, you need to take a lot of physics because optometry is about optics, about how light interacts with lenses and things like that. And the physics part of that is pretty math intensive. Some students find that that piece is really, really hard. Other students find that it's really easy. Um, you'll need to take some biochemistry because you're dealing with uh, proteins and interactions of chemicals with the proteins in eyes and um, Chemistry is, it can be very difficult for some people. Some people find that's really hard. You need to know anatomy and physiology and biology, right? And that's a lot of information, uh, very complex systems that are all interrelated and interlocking. And um, some people find that information overwhelming and very difficult. And then the last thing is, you're gonna be dealing with people a lot. You're gonna be 
communicating, speaking, you're going to be, you, you don't get a choice of who your customers are, right? And so you're going to be dealing with people from all sorts of different backgrounds with all sorts of different preconceptions. And so some people find that it's the personal, the people interactions that are the most difficult, um, right? And that's why there are prerequisites for optometry program of like speak, speech class. You have to ha take speech class. You have to ha take writing classes. You have to take uh, English classes, right? Where some of it is about the literature, but really what, what is literature about? It's about learning about how different kinds of people interact or think. Right. And so um, what you find the most difficult in going through a program is really going to be defined by your own individual strengths and weaknesses. Awesome. Thank you. That is a lot of great insight that even I didn't know about. So we appreciate that. Uh, we are getting some questions um, via private message and we have another one that was through the registration. Um, how would we get informed on the pre-med requirements if we want to do a pre-med track and just kind of Keep it general for now. Uh, so a, a couple things. Um, there's information on our website about the pre-med requirements. Um, and pre-med requirements are fairly standard across the country, right? They require a year of general chemistry. They require a year of, of organic chemistry. They require you know, X amount of biology and physics and calculus and, and all that kind of stuff. Right, so that's easy information to look up on the web. Um, but actually getting those courses in the right sequence while you're completing a major, while you're completing our general education can be a little bit tricky. And so there are two things that are going to help you there. Uh, one is your academic advisor. Every student is assigned an academic advisor from the very first even before they, they uh, walk in the door. I actually got an email today about the first virtual meetings that we're going to be having, having with our new advisor, advisees um, on August 20th and 21st. So that's coming up pretty close. Right? And the role of the academic advisor is to listen to you, the student, listen to what your plans are, what your goals are, and try to figure out how uh, to create a pathway through Pacific that optimizes your opportunities, right? So most of the time, what I spend my time with advisors doing is figuring out, okay, how can we move forward on the path that you're currently on and keep all other options open for the longest time? Because a lot of people change their mind about what direction they want to go in. They, they find new information and um, they decide to, to change directions and change pathways, right? And most of our programs are designed so that it's trivial to change pathways your first year. Like it, it's generally not a problem. Uh, changing pathways in your second year uh, gets a little bit trickier, right? Because for example, in chemistry, it's, you can complete a chemistry major in three years. You can start taking general chemistry in your second year, but it's more hard, difficult because you have to pack in um, courses in your senior year that would be spread out over junior and senior year normally, right? So you can do that. And so the advise, academic advisor is going to help individuals design a pathway through that. And if pre-med is the pathway, right, they know, they'll know the, the, the pre-med um, requirements and they'll help design a, a, a course um, of study that will optimize that. And then there's also a, a pre-med club and a pre-med, a specialized pre-med advisor. These are all sorts of, of resources for doing that. Awesome. And um, I know we mentioned before a center at Pacific that helps students get shadowing jobs. How early can students um, shadow at, you know, specific jobs or clinics? Um, so I think <laughs> students can start shadowing as early as they want. Um, you have access to the Career Advising Center from the day you walk in the door. And so if that's something that you're really focused on, go visit them the first week of, of classes, right? Before things get uh, a little bit overwhelming, which they will get a little overwhelming, especially the first semester um, in a new environment with new expectations. Um, and so you can go anytime. They can start helping you set that kind of thing up. 
Um, some of our students actually will set shadow um, their first year, their first summer. We have a winter term that a lot of times first and second year students will uh, use that time to do shadowing, right? Because a two, a two week or three week window is a great opportunity to kind of test something out that you're maybe not totally committed, you want to find out about something. Awesome. Um, can you talk a little bit about what the lectures versus labs kind of look like at Pacific? Um, so, I'll talk about what lectures look like versus lectures versus lectures first. <laughs> Wait, so lab is hands-on. Um, science is about discovering new information, new ways of thinking about our natural world through doing experiments. And so an important part of a scientific education uh, is actually doing experiments, right? And so most of our courses in science have an associated lab where you go in and um, do a prescribed experiment. And in first year classes, usually the experiments are, okay, here are the directions, here's what our goal is, follow the directions, repeat the procedure and measure on your own this property or that property or make this molecule or something like that and then test to make sure that you've actually done what you think you've done. Um, as you go on in our curriculum, you start to have project-based labs where, um, so for example, I used to teach environmental chemistry and the first half of the semester, we would do labs where students learn how to do, use all the instrumentation, use how to use uh, in, uh, inductively coupled plasma atomic absorption spectrometer, right? It's, it's an instrument used for measuring the, the uh, amount of metal ions in different samples, soil samples, water samples, you know, uh, tissue samples. And then the second half of that term, I had students des design their own experiment where they decided something they were interested in um, and then measured the contaminants or, or what have you. So some students measured things like um, DDT in soil samples or uh, tissue samples. One of our environmental um, professors was interested in sturgeon tissue at the time. Or they measured the lead contamination in um, an old dump site that was on Pacific property uh, at our Arboretum. And so they sampled soil in different areas and, and measured that. Or one group measured uh, chromium and copper contamination at a pl uh, children's playground nearby. Because it turns out in the old days they used to uh, treat the wood uh, at outdoor wood with uh, toxic metals, right? And so even if those um, that equipment was replaced, the soil still might have some of those contaminants in. And so the students were interested in that and they, they, they did that, right? So the labs, you start out with prescribed experiments where you're learning techniques, learning how to do experiments, how to be careful, how to record uh, in information properly. Then as you get to more upper division, uh, you start to do more project-based where you actually design experiments uh, and make decisions about how to carry them out. Right? And it's a process of learning how to be a scientist. So our lectures, um, there, it turns out there's a huge variety in how professors approach lecture. Um, some people get in and talk. Some people are really good at that, about presenting information using PowerPoint or chalkboard or drawings. Um, they're really good at presenting information in a clear and concise way for students to understand, right? And of course, there's always gonna be interaction. The advantage, instead of watching a video, you can ask questions. If I didn't understand what the professor just said, you interrupt and say, <laughs> what are you talking about? Could you go over that again? Or that wasn't clear. Um, so some are, are straight lecture. I think more common, is a mixture of lecture and kind of activities, right? So um, typically when I lecture, I'll uh, introduce a concept for maybe five or 10 minutes of lecture where I present things on the board or using PowerPoint or something like that. And then um, I'll present 
a problem that uh, requires you to apply the concept that I just talked about. So I'll present a problem myself, and then I'll have the students work on a problem for maybe five or 10 minutes. And then I'll repeat that process for the next concept. So I'll do maybe three concepts in a given class uh, period. Other professors um, have started doing flipped classrooms where they'll record a lecture uh, ahead of time, have students listen to the lecture online ahead of time, and then they'll um, start class by uh, asking if anybody has any questions about it, and then they'll do like a quiz about that, right? And the quizzes, you know, are you know, low points or whatever. It's mostly to make sure that that students are understanding the basic ideas that were gone over in that online lecture, right? And then they'll spend the next period, and, and so students can then, oh, I didn't, I thought I understood this, but I didn't really understood it because I got it wrong on this, on this in-class quiz. And then they spend the next 20 or 30 minutes working on developing in more depth those concepts, right? And that can either be through discussions uh, about uh, what people got right or wrong or uh, discussions about uh, more in-depth topics, or it could be based on worksheets or problems that are a little bit more advanced that, allow, that ask you to extend the ideas from the video lecture to a broader or more specific, depending on, on the thing, um, problem or topic. Um, and then like in general chemistry, we have students work through act, what are activity workbooks where the activity workbook consists of a series of um, kind of a cyclical process where there's some data presented. We ask students questions to pick out data. So they start to identify the structure of the data, how it's organized and things like that. Then we ask them questions on there where um, they're asked to draw connections between different types of data or different pieces of data. And it might be, you know, ask them to, to graph the data and describe the mathematical relationship or something like that. And then the next piece in, in the process is to have them apply the relationship or idea to specific chemistry problems. Right, so it's a way of asking the students to take the data, develop the relationships, develop the ideas in this process. And they work in teams to do this. And in that situation, the professor is just walking around the class and helping out individual groups when they get stuck. And then if the class as a whole is struggling with a particular thing, they'll stop the class and then have a little mini lecture or discussion about that particular topic. And then after each little section, professor generally will stop and summarize what the class learned to make sure that, that uh, we actually all did get the, the topic. So that's much more of an active, interactive kind of process. So there's a huge variety in, in how professors approach uh, lecture. Awesome, and I think um, this is kind of like the big question, the golden question with COVID happening this fall and labs being kind of one of those close contact uh, type of settings. Um, do we know how it's going to look this fall? I know um, for all the uh, folks here today, everyone is deposited and already um, coming to, uh, committed to Pacific. And so um, do you have a better idea of what fall is gonna look like for our incoming students this year? Yeah, so it will depend a little bit on how things go. We're adjusting our approach on at least a weekly basis, right? We're bound by the um, restrictions placed on us by, the, you know, the, the, the government or, or what have you. Um, currently, what it looks like is uh, we're going to be in phase, what's called phase one, which means no groups more than 25, um, social distancing, all that kind of stuff. So what this looks like for the labs, um, so last fall, we, we went completely online, right? And that was not the best thing for labs because lab, it really is about hands-on learning, about actually doing the experiments. 
And it's very different watching somebody ride a bike than actually riding a bike, right? Um, so what it means for our labs currently is that normally we have labs of 24 students and they work in pairs, right? And it's spaced out so that the pairs aren't bumping into each other, right? That's kind of the natural design. Um, with COVID, we're cutting the capacity of our labs in half. And so instead of people being able to work in pairs, the students are gonna be working individually. And what this means is that our lab capacity was cut in half. We don't have more facilities. And so what we're doing is having students do lab every other week. So every other week, students will go into a, a lab and actually hands-on do the lab. And there will be 12 students in a space that was designed uh, spaciously for 24, right? And we've, there was a team of uh, professors and staff that worked over the summer measuring rooms um, and making sure that within those classroom spaces, there was enough social distance so that students are not going to be cross-contaminated, right? So they're at least six feet. And in the labs, um, there's actually gonna be quite a bit more than six feet. And the other thing about labs is that the, um, for other reasons, there's huge airflow in labs, right? The uh, ventilation system in labs is designed so that contam chemical contamination is swept out of the room so people aren't exposed to chemical contamination. Well, it turns out it works just as, as, as well for aerosols. And so the, la the air in our lab rooms uh, changes, I think every eight minutes, something like that, right? And so um, it's almost like being outdoors in the labs. I think the labs are actually probably the, the safest place to be uh, in this particular environment. Um, so on off weeks, it will depend on the professors, what they actually decide to do. I, I'm going to be teaching organic chemistry labs this semester, two of the labs. And so on the off weeks, um, what we're doing is we're designing um, worksheets basically based on laboratory information, right? So uh, the labs that we're taking out, um, we're deciding which are the important concepts that aren't going to be covered as well as we would like them to be covered in the rest of our curriculum and designing um, worksheets where, again, it's one of these ideas where we kind of make a mock-up lab where we give data that would have been measured and then ask students to go through the analysis so they get the, the scientific analysis part of the lab and the concepts of um, how this relates to the lecture material that they're learning. Right? So they won't have the week completely off, but it's not gonna be the same. And it won't be, certainly it won't be the same amount of work for that piece as for a normal lab. And that's one of the other things we're trying to balance is, turns out um, doing things virtually is more work for everybody involved, for students as well as faculty. And so we're trying to balance the, uh, what we're asking students and faculty to actually do. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, I wanted... One more thing. Uh -huh. um, so we're trying to figure out, some of our students are, are completely uh, online this term, right? And we're trying to figure out how to do that for, what's the solution for, for lab, right? And so I think in organic chemistry, again, I think what we're gonna do is the other professor and I are going to do the labs and we're gonna videotape, videotape, listen to me, I'm so old. Um, we're going to record uh, doing the labs and so, but without commentary. And we're gonna ask those virtual students to watch the, those videos record the information. So for example, we'll go over and weigh the materials and we're not gonna say, okay, 3.85 grams. We're, we're going to say, you have to record all the information, all the observations as we're going along. Um, and so it's as close as we could come, I think, to them doing the actual labs. And who knows, maybe I'll mess up a couple times in, in labs and, tr and, and try to uh, recover 
because that's actually a really important thing in science is when you make mistakes, how do you recover? How do you correct as you're doing it? Um, okay, so I think that's it. Thank you. No, that was great. I know one of the feedback that we've been getting from our high school students was that once they went online, it was just a lot of busy work. And um, so I'm, I'm glad that you guys were able to recognize that as well, too. And hopefully it, uh, it works out. Um, one of the questions that we got is, can you talk about the 3-3 the three, three, um, pharmacy pathway? Is it only available for students majoring in environmental toxicology and chemistry? Uh, yes, it is, right? That was a program specially designed to pack seven years of uh, education down into three years of education, right? And they made some compromises in terms of the, the senior level work where there was enough overlap, they felt, with pharmacy to uh, overlap with the uh, toxicology program. Um, so that's a program that's only in VAR, uh, available in environmental toxicology and chemistry. Uh, we have talked about doing a similar thing in the chemistry program, program <clears throat> but decided that we didn't really want to compete with the environmental program. Um, it's a program that has uh, only two professors currently, well, I guess three professors, um, and we, it's a program that we kind of want to grow. And we didn't feel like in chemistry, it necessarily would add much by adding this, a new chemistry 3-3 program with pharmacy. Because basically the, the classes that you would take in the chemistry program are pretty much the same classes that you would take in the pharmacy program. And the one class that we don't offer that, that would be required is the uh, toxicology class, right? And, and right, you, that I would, absolutely recommend that for anybody going to pharmacy. I mean, it's a great class. Right, but it's something that we may decide to do in the future and maybe biology is talking about it. I don't, I don't know. Um, I would have to ask one of the biology professors if they've discussed that. Right? And for the other programs, it doesn't really make sense to actually do a 3-3 with pharmacy. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, so you talked about like the pre-med club. Um, how do students get involved with all these kind of like these pre-clubs that are on campus? Probably the best way is, uh, I think it's the second week of class. There is a club fair. So all the clubs on campus um, set up a, a club. They basically set up booths and you can go and talk to the people that are involved in the club and um, find out if it's something you're interested in. They have sign-up sheets and then you get on email lists and they communicate about that. I imagine that this year they'll probably do a virtual club fair. Um, I have not seen any uh, information about that because that's on the student side and, and the professors here don't get all the communication about what's going on on the student side. So Gina, do you know what they're doing there? I know they're working on um, maybe making things virtual, kind of like a job fair, where obviously we're not going to be able to have the tables out and have large gatherings. And so uh, I do know they're still working on it, but I agree. I, I think the last I heard that is that they're going to try to make it virtual. So uh, we'll make sure to, that you guys get the information. And um, there are bulletin announcements that go out. So um, as things are changing and we get closer to date, you'll start getting some of those updates uh, through uh, the different various uh, communications that we have. So thank you. Um, one of the questions that we get is, um, I know a lot of students know about senior projects and they're kind of scared a little bit about what senior projects are and how that looks like. How do they get started? Where do they start? Who do they go to? All of that kind of, you know, the question mark bubbles that are around their head. Um, can you go into a little detail about senior projects for the chem department and maybe some like past um, projects that really stood out to you? So that's thinking ahead. <laughs> Um, senior projects, uh, so ultimately, a Pacific education should allow you to be an independent 
creator of knowledge in your field. That's the ultimate goal, right? The, the actual information that you get while you're in college, it may or may not be obsolete 10 years from now, right? But learning how to learn, learning how to be independent um, is something that will stay with you forever. Right, and so that's kind of the function of our senior projects. It's the last step where seniors have to demonstrate that they can take on an independent project in their chosen field and do something meaningful with it, right? Create meaningful information or knowledge that people maybe don't know already, right? And so it's a process, right? And so our whole, our whole curriculum is geared towards getting you to that place, right? So you, the first year you take introductory classes that tend to be broad in general and introduce a lot of different ideas. And they can be really confusing because it's a lot of different ideas that spread across this broad array and it's not necessarily clear how everything is interconnected until you have that broad array. So it's a chicken before the egg kind of thing. How do you put things into the structure before there's a structure to put them into? Um, right, so the, the, the intro courses try to give a broad structure so that later on, the more specific knowledge you get can be scaffolded or placed into this structure. You build from this foundation up to this apex. And then you, you know, sophomore year and junior year, you, you get more uh, specific information, more narrow information, more technical information. And as I said, for the labs, um, you tend not just in, in labs, but also in lectures, you start to have more project-based things where you need to start putting more of yourself into to the, the project, whether that's an experiment that you're designing or a paper where you are coming up with the topic, you are coming up with all the sources um, and then investigating it yourself, right? So it's a process of, of giving you those skills. In chemistry, when you're a junior, the, the spring semester of your junior year, there's a course that we uh, require of all majors called chemical literacy. And this is kind of the pre-senior capstone project course. And I think there are similar courses in a lot of the majors. And in that course, um, again, it's called chemical literacy. And we learn about um, how do you find information in the chemical literature? And so we spend quite a bit of time um, doing uh, electronic searches of the technical literature for specific information. And we start that project, that class, by looking at problems from organic chemistry, which is a sophomore level class. So I know, so I taught that last last uh, spring. And so I know that all the students have had organic chemistry, they have the basic understanding of the, uh, the subfield. And so when they're searching for specific information in that subfield, they have some basis for sorting out whether it's good or bad information, or reliable information or not reliable information, right? And so we spend quite a bit of time then talking about critical thinking about the sources that you're picking and then how information from dif different sources mesh. So they kind of end that project by getting a bunch of different sources and then writing a paper that kind of synthesizes all those different, that different information into, into one paper. And then the second half of that class, they do the same thing, but the first step is picking a mentor for their capstone, senior capstone project. Right? So they spend a couple of weeks going around to all the professors in the chemistry department and asking them about the projects that they have going ongoing, right? Because in chemistry, at least, the students are going to be working with a professor on a project that the professor is actually interested in, right? So this fall, I have two students working on projects. One student is working on a project looking at um, contamination in street sweepings. And this is a collaboration with um, 
the Clean Water Services, which is uh, who deals with our, the, the waste in the area. And they have people that are, that they collect street sweepings and they were interested in, well, what's in these? Can we actually just put these in our landfill or do we have to worry about it? Nobody knew, right? And so uh, one of my students is going to be um, measuring samples and looking at uh, copper and lead and I forget what the other contaminant is in that, right? So it was a, a project that um, she was kind of interested in environmental chemistry. I was aware that Clean Water Services when it was interested in that, and so we kind of brought those two things together. And so she spent last spring investigating how do you actually measure the different um, metal contaminations and different types of samples. Who has already measured um, street sweeping contamination levels? And it turns out there were two papers on it. One was from India and one was from North Carolina. And so looking at international kinds of, of information. My other student is looking at making basically synthetic hemoglobin out of inorganic materials. I'm an inorganic chemist, chemist. I'm interested in how metals interact in biological, biological systems. And so um, he is developing a system to take an iron ion and embed it into an inorganic material and then allow it to mimic the behavior of hemoglobin where hemoglobin reversibly, it will bind oxygen and then release under certain conditions and then release it under, under, under other conditions, right? So he's doing that. And so that was a project I've had other students work on in the past. And he um, is taking a different track using different materials to do it because the stuff we were using before didn't work. My other student, last student found it didn't work. Um, and so that's what he spent the spring doing was figuring out, well, what are the properties of these other materials going to be? What kinds of techniques do I need to use? What kinds of skills do I need to use? Right? And it was a conversation we had, and I kind of pointed him in the right direction, but he went in the literature and found all that information. And so that's kind of the process. And both those students will be working in the labs independently in the fall. Um, in the chemistry building, each of the professors has their own research lab, which is big enough for probably under COVID uh, rules, probably two people. Um, but uh, generally, I only had two people working in there anyway, right? It's one student and then me if I need to show them something, right? So it really is independent work. And I have a, a, clarifi uh, a clarification question, which I think um, um, if you don't know the answer to it, we can definitely follow up uh, uh, separately. But um, you had mentioned um, that there was a toxicology class. Um, um, do you know what it might be called, um, where they can find the information um, for it was in regards to the 3-3 program when we were discussing that? I think it's just called toxicology. It's in the environmental uh, sciences program, environmental okay. chemistry program. Perfect, perfect. So I'll go ahead and follow up with the list of the requirements there. Okay. Um, the next uh, question, I believe this might be the There's last question. Also a separate um, chemistry and to toxicology lab, which is separate from the toxicology lecture. Okay, so is they might they might be actually changing and combining environmental chemistry and toxicology into one lecture as well. Were, I know they were talking about that. Um, we, we actually hired a new um, environmental chemist three years ago. Mm -hmm. and spent the first two years learning about our program and getting comfortable in our curriculum. And now she's starting to say, well, we could do it better, right? And so she, she might be actually deciding to change that. Awesome. Do you know um, who the best contact person would be for that? Uh, so the, for the environmental chemistry and toxicology, it would be Deke Gunderson. Oh, yeah, Deke. That's, right, his, that's his specialty. Yeah, that's who I thought it was. All right. Well, yeah, and in, in chemistry, uh, it would be Julie Leshock. And either one would be fine. They, they, they know all the ins and outs. Awesome, awesome. We'll get Deke's contact information because I, I, I know he came into our office and told us a little bit about that program as yeah. well too. Um, the, the last question that we have is actually a pretty good question. Um, do you think um, I have an advantage studying at undergrad program at Pacific University to get into Pacific's grad school, such as getting to know the professor, 
maybe having like a better kind of segue into grad program. Um, can you talk about, I guess, the, the advantages of being an undergrad at Pacific to get into our grad school? Uh, so absolutely, there is an advantage for two reasons. First is structural. Right? We have this Advantage program where if you're part of the Advantage program, I believe you're uh, guaranteed uh, interviews at, um, in the programs depending on, as, as long as you meet the requirements, i.e. GPA and, and, and stuff like that. Um, so you have guaranteed interviews, which is nice because oftentimes that's the hard part is getting your foot in the door. So that's one thing. Um, the second thing is that our programs are kind of like our chemistry program. I mean, we're aware that a lot of our students are interested in health professions. And so a lot of the content of um, courses is semi-tailored to health professions, right? So in my inorganic class, I spend much more time talking about biological um, impacts of metal ions in biological systems than I think is typical in um, an inorganic chemistry course. And same thing in, in general chemistry, a lot of the examples that I use come from health professions, right? And so I think that that's a common trend in our courses. So you're exposed all the way through the curriculum to um, just here and there, more examples, more applications, more relationships um, to health professions. So that was number two. Number three is people are people. Um, and so for example, we have, probably two or three students every year that do research, maybe more, I don't, I don't know, that do research with the pharmacy graduate professors. And guess what? If you're doing research with John Harrelson, the professor in, in the pharmacy program, and you apply to the pharmacy program, you can guess how that's gonna go, right? As, again, as long as you do well in your classes and are um, meeting the requirements, uh, he will know you really well. He'll know your strengths and weaknesses. And so you're probably going to get into, into the pharmacy program in that situation. Right? And like I said, there are, we typically have three or four students every year, I think, that do research with the pharmacy faculty. And it's not just in chemistry, it's also in, in biology or environmental uh, toxicology as well. Um, there's also easy access, right? If you're interested, you have questions, it's easy to contact them and, and just drop by and ask them questions, right? And they're all really happy to, to talk to potential students um, about their programs. People are very excited to talk about their own stuff. <laughs> they are, and I know a lot of our students are super excited um, for this new kind of, uh, path in life where they just finally are out of high school and on their way to college and are looking forward to it. And I actually spoke with a student yesterday on the phone saying he's super excited about all the labs because he told me he's a total geek and that's kind of his number one thing that he's looking forward to. So um, thank you so much, Joel, for uh, joining us um, and you know giving us your time today to talk about the chemistry department. And I know it's something that uh, this, these series have helped a lot of our families kind of understand what it's going to look like and I um, love that you were able to go into some um, details about what the lab is going to look like and um, just kind of explain all of that. Um, and so um, thank you again. Um, and um, next week we will actually have, um, it's going to be kind of like our unofficial handoff uh, to the rest of campus. So uh, we will have our student affairs. We'll have somebody from student life as well as the student um, health center um, come with us um, to kind of introduce themselves again. Housing will be there as well as an um, orientation. So all the rest of campus and all these resources that are going to be available for you as a student um, now that you are a boxer. So when you come into 
uh, campus on fall or you're remote in fall, you'll know who to contact for specific resources. Um, you can go ahead and sign up for that and register for that ahead of time. It's on our admissions webpage, um, or you can wait for the invitation that gets sent out early next week. Um, thank you so much. And any, any last words for our families here, um, Joel, today? Well, thank you for coming. Um, I hope it was informational. And if you have any other questions, please feel free to contact me. Uh, go to underscore J at pacificu.edu, or you can uh, find the um, chemistry website and, and, and find my information off that as well. Hey, there it is in chat. <laughs> there it is. Uh, so feel free to email Joel if you have any questions about the, uh, you know, the, the session today. Uh, a recording of this will, will be emailed out to everybody either today or tomorrow. Um, thank you again, everybody. Thank you, Joel, again for your time. Um, have a great rest of the week. Hopefully you guys are staying cool. It's kind of hot in Oregon this week. So uh, we finally have our summer weather. And we'll see you next week, everybody. Take care and have a great week.